Well, welcome to Worship with Restoration Church. Uh, my name is Jeff. I serve as the lead pastor. So grateful to have you here at this time. Whether you're here with us in person or here with us online, uh, Saturday night or Sunday morning or beyond, uh, we are one church gathered at different times, different locations. As a church, we recognize that life is hard and we all need restoration. Isn't that true? And, and so you've come to the right place, right? Our prayer and desire is that not only in this worship service, but all aspects of our church family, that we would embrace the grace of Jesus Christ, that that grace would come to life. And tonight, that's my prayer for you and for all of us as we gather for worship, that grace would come to life as we meet at this time. Because when our life stories intersect with God's story, great things happen. Right? When our life story intersects with God's grace and his truth and his love, we are restored. And, and so as we sing songs, as we pray, as we hear from God's words, we participate in communion, as we are here tonight, uh, let's open ourselves up to God and what he has for us. Um, if you're new with us or want more information, one way to do that is to, connect to, is to check into our Connect card. And you could text the word CONNECT uh, to our church management system number. That's 804-362-0052. If you text the word CONNECT to that number, uh, you'll have a Connect card. You can ask for new information, sign up for our email list. That's a great way to get information and to stay up to date on what's happening as a church. Uh, the weekly email and our website are key ways to do that. Uh, so as we move into our next part of our worship service, I want to read from the Gospel of Luke. And in this season, as we consider the birth of Jesus, or we consider some shepherds. And if you've been around the church, this is a well-known account, right? Shepherds who came looking eventually for Jesus with a sense of expectancy and a sense of anticipation. Uh, may that be our heart tonight and this time as we gather for worship here. In Luke chapter 2, verse 8, we read this. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watching over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Right? Thousands of years ago, these shepherds went to meet Jesus tonight, at this day, on this time, we're here to meet with Jesus as well. Let's worship him. Super Bowl 27 was mostly unforgettable for a lot of those involved, especially the losing team, Buffalo, who lost their third straight Super Bowl. It was mostly a blowout, but one of the events that lives on in memory happened in the fourth quarter. When the game was almost out of hand, there was a fumble, and the Cowboys defensive lineman, 6'6", 300-pound Leon Lett, scooped up the ball with only green pasture in front of him. Run. You could almost hear Chris Berman saying, he could go Oh, the... Little did he know that, he, that there was a receiver for the Bills racing beside him, and he started celebrating a bit too early. The ball got stripped, went through the end zone, and Leon Lett lives in infamy for wasting a touchdown. Now, th th although he is a, uh, you could say, a warning to any lineman who might try to score a touchdown, that he also actually gives a picture of joy. My, my pastor, when I was in college, described the joy of faith as this, doing an end zone dance at the 50-yard line. The joy of faith is celebrating in the moment, knowing that the completion is not yet there knowing that it's on the way, knowing that it hasn't yet happened, but that it will. But that's the joy of faith. And as Christians, we're called to have joy. We're called for this, the, to invite the Spirit in us to have joy at all times, at all circumstances, in suffering, in trials, 
and persecution because we are trusting that God is doing something bigger in all of those things, that God is working in us to work to his will, that God is working in the world towards his will, that his promises are coming true, and that God will work all things for the good of those who love him. So we're called to have joy. We're called to do a touchdown dance at the 50-yard line. And this passage that Jeff, that Jeff just read is interesting because the angels call the shepherds to have joy. But if you think about it, that nothing meaningful was going to happen for another 30 years. There's just a baby. But they're called to have joy. They're called to celebrate in the moment what was going to happen. And as we live in this time of Advent, where that only maybe little signs of the kingdom have come, that we look to the bigger reality when they will all come to pass, and God will make all things new. So in Advent, we are called to have joy. We choose joy. Join with me in prayer as the worship team comes up. God, you are the author of life, that you are the author of redemption, and you call us to have joy, to trust that you are doing work in our midst. So God, pray that we would celebrate, not out of optimism, not out of a false sense of security, but out of trust in, you, in your character and your promises. Uh, we lift this time up in Jesus' name. Amen. We are called to have joy. If you are so inclined, stand and sing with us. Hark the herald angels sing.
you can grab a seat. Uh, all throughout the Bible, but especially in the Old Testament, you see after God shows up for his people is that they give an offering, a sacrifice in response to that, not as a way to earn his favor, but as a demonstration of gratitude towards him saying, we worship you, we honor you. And in the New Testament, we see that not only are we called to give offerings and sacrifices of tangible things, but really it's a picture of giving our hearts, of giving ourselves to God. And so we're coming to the time of offering. That, so two things that I want to say. One, uh, there are a variety of ways that you can give financially, but also the reason why we celebrate this is as a demonstration that we get to bring our whole selves to God. And in the prayer time that I'm going to have, that one of the things that I'm reminded of is that God calls us to come as we are. That he doesn't say, hey, only if you're this, come, or only if you're this, but come as you are. And so in my prayer time, that I'm recognizing that probably for many of us, we come with different griefs. Either the standard COVID grief of what we're not receiving or not having because of how different, on top of all the other griefs that we're bringing. Um, so we're going to bring those things to God together, and I have a, a short prayer that I'm going to read for that, but also going to get a chance to pray for our, um, our church plant, the branch in Ashland, that God would continue to fuel their work. So if you could, um, bow your heads with me while we, while we pray, and I'm going to start by reading a brief prayer. Uh, God, in one hand I grasp the burden of my grief, while with the other I reach for the hope of grief's redemption. And here, between the tension of the two, between what was and what will be, in the very is of now, let my heart be surprised by, shaped by, warmed by, remade by the same joy that forever wells within and radiates from your heart, O God. God, thank you that you allow us to come as we are and that you meet us in that. Thank you that the joy that you call us to isn't a joy dependent on circumstance, but dependent on your promise and your presence. And God, we ask for your joy tonight as we give ourselves to you. God, we pray for these offerings that we're giving, that they would continue to fuel your work through this church and in the world. God, would you multiply these things for your glory? God, we also pray for the branch in Ashland. Thank you for the way that they are getting to be a signpost of redemption a witness for your grace and your kindness, to be a place where life and faith meet, to help people see that faith matters in all parts of life. So God, I pray for John and the leadership team um, that you would encourage them. Pray that you would empower them to fulfill your purposes. Pray that you provide for their needs. Pray that you'd give them wisdom in all the endeavors that they do. And God, pray that they would have great joy as they do it. Would you give their team unity even as they're apart? God, thank you that you're always at work pray that you would help us to have eyes to see where you're working, that we can joyfully participate in that. How we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
is the good shepherd. When there is danger, the shepherd keeps the sheep safe. If a thief comes to try and take the sheep, the shepherd will protect the sheep. If a wolf comes to try and capture one of the sheep, the shepherd will guard the sheep. He will not leave them unprotected. The shepherd is willing to lay down his life for the sheep. Whenever a sheep is lost, the shepherd will find it and bring it home. And even when the shepherd leads the sheep through dark and scary places, he comforts the sheep and protects it. The shepherd brings his sheep safely home where no one can harm him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world. And you there in you there is no darkness. And as it's been shared and known in John chapter 1, where the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. At your name, darkness does tremble. At your name, every knee should bow. Jesus, you are worthy of our praise. And in a season of struggle, in a season in many ways that feels like darkness. Lord Jesus, we need your light in our lives. We need you to not only light the way, but to show us the way. And we can praise you knowing that you are the way. And so teach us tonight from your word. We ask and humbly ask that you would open up our hearts to what you want to give to us. A word of hope, a word of help, a word of restoration. And we look to you in the powerful, powerful name that is your name, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, 2020, what a year. I hear some boos from the crowd. <laughs> yeah, it really is, right? If you're thinking one year, three years, five years, 10 years, God willing, we're alive years ahead as we look back and say 2020, it's going to bring back all kinds of images, all kinds of memories, all kinds of struggles. As I've been reflecting on this year and thinking about why has it been so hard, there's the obvious answers. But apart from the coronavirus and COVID-19, apart from all the different struggles that are happening out in our culture and that we're facing, as I think about 2020, I think about all of the uncertainty. And you think about having to make decision after decision after decision, not knowing what the next day is going to bring, let alone the next week, let alone the next month, definitely not knowing the next year. And in some ways it can feel like we're walking in the dark. Right, there's something about the unknown, the unknown that could be intimidating, the unknown that could be scary. 
I know for me, as I think about it over my life, when I've faced unknown seasons or unknown times, those are the moments when anxiety can well up within me and at points take over if I don't let God check it and get in the way. There's something about our bodies. Our bodies prepare for those struggles when there's an unknown season or an unknown time. It's, it's our bodies begin to, to feel that anxiety and prepare to engage in a way that wouldn't when it's at rest or when the future is more certain. I think about sometimes when you're watching a scary movie or if you're looking at a big maybe roller coaster or something that's uncertain. That's, that's one thing. But when it comes to real life, when it comes to real challenges in, in your life that, that you didn't ask for, and you have to face those challenges, and you don't know how they're going to turn out. That's a whole different story. Now, I think about walking in the darkness or in the unknown, and I shared stories from my childhood about a place, a, a nature reservation that was near my town. It was called the Watching Reservation. I've shared stories about walking in the woods, but what I didn't share is a story one time about my friends who we went to one part of the Watching Reservation where there was something called the Deserted Village. I'm just going to show you a picture here of, of, of part of this deserted village. It was a, a village that was built in the 19th century. And over the years, uh, because of changing industry, that, that people stopped living there, and it became what became known as the deserted village. And it was fine during the day to look at these houses, but at night, it's a different story. And at night, uh, my friends and I thought it would be fun to have a little bit of a challenge, a little bit of a dare Say, who'd be willing to walk down the path to the, to the deserted village? And so I remember arriving at a parking lot, and as we came to that parking lot, we took a bunch of sticks, and it's like whoever draws the shortest stick has to go, has to walk down that path pretty much into the pitch darkness. There was a little bit of a moon that night, I recall. But as we pulled the sticks, who got the shortest sticks? stick? Me. I'm like, great. So I'm like, here we go. So I start walking down the path. And let me tell you some more background uh, information about this deserted village. You can Google it. And there's a book called Weird New Jersey. It has all these stories about the, desert, the deserted village. But there was all kinds of stories where the houses haunted. Like people said that when they walked near those houses, they felt the temperature drop by 20 degrees. I mean, there's all these kinds of rumors. So I start walking down this path in the pitch dark one step after another. Maybe if we had planned ahead, we could have cut the lights right now. But I was walking, in the, and it kept getting darker and darker and darker. And though there's a little bit of a moon, I could see a house like that next to me. And I could start feeling scared. And I remember I was walking. All I could hear was the sound of my feet on the ground. Until out of nowhere, crack! Somewhere near one of the homes, I don't know if a piece of wood fell from a tree or someone stepped on something, but I heard and I turned and I ran as fast as possible all the way back to that parking lot. I don't know how I didn't trip and fall on my face. If I did, I probably would have screamed. But when I got back to that parking lot, I could feel my heart pounding because of the fear of being in the unknown. All right, as you think about that feeling, if you've ever had an experience like that of walking in the darkness, Right, that's just walking into the woods. But when it comes to real life, when we walk down paths of darkness, walk down paths of uncertainty, where anxieties and fears pop up, what are we to do? How are we to face it? And especially, again, when life offers us challenges, and especially in 2020, we've experienced all kinds of challenges. When we run into those challenges, life's challenges, relational challenges. And when there's a relational challenge that you didn't ask for, Maybe it's struggles in your marriage. Maybe it's a relationship with a child or a sibling. Maybe it's a, a friendship that's gone bad and you don't know how to repair it. And you're facing that relational challenge and you don't know how it's going to turn out. Maybe it's a financial challenge. As you think about your life and think about all the changing aspects of the, of the global economy as you look towards 2021 and maybe in terms of losing a job or maybe it's not you but someone that you know who's lost a job and they're facing a challenge. They don't know what's gonna, how it's going to turn out. Or maybe it's a physical challenge. So you think about your life. Maybe it's a diagnosis that you didn't think you were going to receive. Maybe for you or for a loved one. And you don't know how it's going to turn out. Or maybe if it's something you've experienced recently where that diagnosis did come and you didn't know how it was going to turn out. What are we to do in those times? When we face those dark paths that could lead to deep fears and anxieties, where do we turn? 
Well, the good news is that the Bible and Jesus never say that we are to take those challenges on alone. That he offers hope, that he offers help, and he offers us everything we need. Because Jesus is the good shepherd. And that's our focus in these weeks leading up to Christmas. Jesus is the good shepherd. And we're looking at the great Psalm 23. Right, a picture of the good shepherd who, who takes care of his sheep. Right, and this great psalm is we're going through it from the whole the whole psalm. And we're gonna today we're gonna today we're gonna focus on verse four, but I want to read the first couple of verses just so we can review each week, building up as we take on this entire psalm. And so from Psalm chapter twenty three, we read this, these great words: "The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul." He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then this, here's our focus for today. Even though, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Right? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Right, so we review going back a couple weeks. Right, we started with those great words, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23, this incredible prayer. A prayer that my prayers, it would become your prayer. Maybe you've heard the psalm over the years if you've been part of the church. And maybe you've memorized it at points. But to re-memorize it and make it a prayer, not just for this season, but all the way through 2021 and beyond. Because this prayer begins with those incredible words, a bold claim, saying, the Lord is my shepherd. That's a bold claim by David. Right, the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that to be able to claim and say, the Lord, this Lord, the God of all creation, is also my shepherd. Right, this personal connection, this intimate connection with this shepherd that takes care of you. What a bold claim. And because of that, the bold claim then is that we shall not want, that we will lack nothing. So last week we looked at what the shepherd provides, right? Leading the sheep. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And he leads me on the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So last week we considered how the, sh- how sh- the shepherd leads the sheep to food, to water, right? To, to rest and to safety. So that's, those are good things. But this week we move on to, chapter, I mean, to verse 4. And we see the challenges that the sheep face and that the sheep cannot face alone. The words from verse 4, even though, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Don't lose track of those first two words, even though. Even though. Have you had some even though moments this year? Even though. The moments meaning that they're unplanned. They're unanticipated. They're not something you really want. Right? Even though this is going to happen, even though this challenge has come up, even though, even though, I love those words. They're so raw. They're so honest. David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Right? So what is this valley of the shadow of death? Right? There's lots of descriptions. You think of the, the Holy Land where in terms of Israel and all the different, there are diff- different valleys that are there. Right, biblical scholar and, and writer Ken Bailey, who's lived most of his life in that region, talks about what is an actual valley of the shadow of death, which is just south of the road that goes between Jerusalem and Jericho. Right, this valley where that just it goes down into a gorge. And it's like as you walk through this valley, it's almost like being in a cathedral. Both sides go up significantly on both sides. And this valley is about five miles long. And at its widest part, it's 12 miles. 12 feet across, a mere 12 feet across. So I'm about six feet. If I were to lie down and take two of me across, that's the widest it is. And because of that, there's not a lot of room for sheep to turn around. And not only that, it's a very dangerous place. Now we live and and we have electricity and light and and protection. But for these shepherds and these sheep to go out any time after dusk or definitely towards dark was a very dangerous time. And so they'd walk through that valley as quietly as possible to not alert any bandits or anyone who would come and try and attack the, attack the shepherd to, to get the sheep or to, or to take out the shepherd or other animals that could be alerted to a tasty sheep dinner that would be walking through that valley. And so to walk through that valley 
was a very, very scary endeavor. And for these sheep, they were left unprotected. And so we see that, that David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, don't lose track of those words, walk through. To walk through. He's saying, you have to go through it. You can't go around it. There's no other option. You have to go through this valley. For those of you who may have tuned in months ago at one of the initial worship services that we had online when the pandemic began, I spoke about the options that come when we face something too big that we cannot avoid, that we cannot control. The only option is to go through it. And here, David echoes those words. That when we face a life challenge, again, relationships, maybe finances, maybe physical, that's too big, that we can't avoid it, we can't control it, we know we just have to go through it. That's a picture of what David's talking about. But the good news of that verse is he says, but I fear no evil. Right? The greatest threat, evil itself, he says, I fear no evil. Why? He says, because you are with me. Right? David shifts. Right? He's been talking about this good shepherd. Now he speaks personally to the shepherd. Did you notice that shift? He was saying, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He's talking about he. Here he shifts. It's almost as if God comes on the stage. And David says, you are with me. Right? The good shepherd's with him. And the good shepherd's with the sheep as they go through that valley, that challenge. Um, Again, that same author, Ken Bailey, said that the valley of death or deep darkness is a section of the trail that cannot be avoided. Right? There's no bypass road, no magical escape. The only way forward is through the valley of sin and death. And so why is there protection? Now, as we finish up this verse, right, these interesting words that David says, your rod and your staff, they come from me. What's the significance of these two instruments? Right, a sheep who would have seen a shepherd with these two instruments would have felt a sense of peace. Why? Because the rod was not a staff. The rod was a weapon. Not a weapon typically for offense, but a weapon for defense. That's about two and a half foot, almost like mace-like apparatus that was used by the shepherd to, in essence, to knock down, knock away threats to the sheep. This rod was there. Not only to do that, but then in Leviticus 27, we read that when the sheep would come home, he would hold out a rod and the sheep would go underneath it. It wasn't a limbo line. It was to, to have the sheep go under and, and count the amount of sheep. So that was one aspect. The sheep would feel safe because as they went under that rod, they knew that they were safe and home. But he would also use that rod, right, to take down or beat down any threats to the sheep. We get a picture of this in 1 Samuel 17, right, when David makes his case to Saul. And says, I can go fight Goliath. I should be the one to go. Well, what's the justification? We read in chapter 17, verse 34. David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. Right? When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. It's getting violent here. Struck it and killed it. Right? See, David didn't mess around. When it came to his sheep, and he had a rod, and that, his, that was serious business to protect his sheep. That's a picture of what a shepherd had. The other the impl- instrument that the shepherd has is a, is, a, is a staff. And the staff was a longer, lighter, but the staff was used to guide the sheep to the places we talked about last week, to those green pastures, to the still water, to the, on the right paths. And so again, together, those two instruments would have put the sheep at peace recognizing that the shepherd was caring for them. And so they were comforted, right? It says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, I don't know about you, when I hear the word comfort, sometimes I think, oh, comfort, it's, ah, it's being nice. It's like being in a hot tub. It's being comfortable. I don't know. It's, it seems kind of cute and nice, but that's not the biblical word. The word for comfort, the second syllable is the word for fortitude. It's for strength. And so God comforts us. He puts hope to us. He gives us hope. He gives us strength. Here the sheep receive hope and strength because of these two instruments. And not just even because of the two instruments, but the one who's holding those instruments, the good shepherd himself. So how can we receive this gift as we look to the good shepherd today in the 21st century? How can we receive this from Jesus himself? 
How can we receive this comfort? What does this mean for us today? Well, as we think about this passage, the first question is, what valley, deep, dark valley are you facing right now? Can I go back to those categories to help you reflect? As you think about the relationships that you're in. Is there a relational struggle that you're facing that you're not sure how it's going to turn out? Again, maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a sibling. Maybe it's extended family. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a friend. Something's gone wrong, and you're not sure how to get it right. And you need the good shepherd to lead you through that valley. Right? Maybe it's a financial struggle. Maybe it's a, a challenge on the financial front. You're not sure how you're going to make it to the next month. You're not sure how you're going to pay for the future. Whatever that is, bring it to the good shepherd. Or maybe it's physical. A physical challenge you're facing or a loved one's facing. A challenge that no doubt you didn't ask for, but it's come in this broken down world that we live in. As you face that valley for yourself or for a loved one, bring that to the good shepherd. So what are some steps to help us walk through that valley? First, you have to name that valley. There's something powerful about identifying and naming something that you're facing. If you're an audible person, say it out loud. Right? Maybe not in the middle of the grocery store, but say it someplace private and talk, say it out loud. Say it to God. I'm facing this, God. I don't know if I can take it. I don't know if I can handle this. I don't know if I can face this challenge. I don't know what to do. Speak that valley out loud. Others of you are more like, probably like me. I like to write things out. I like to write in a journal. And when I write things out, things become more real to me. And for me, that's the way I'm going to approach it. Say, God, here's the valleys I'm facing. And I'm going to write this out because I know I can't walk through this valley alone. I can't avoid it. I can't control it. But I could walk through it with you. Even if I don't know what that looks like, I want to give it to you. So name that valley, number one. Then call upon the name of Jesus Christ. We read in Scripture in multiple places, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Right? And that salvation is, yes, to give your life to God forever, but it's also an ongoing salvation saying, God, I can't figure this out. I can't figure this out. I don't know how to face this challenge. I don't know how to walk through this valley. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then seek to trust him and walk with him through the valley. One moment at a time, one day at a time. And I would add, don't keep it to yourself. Share this with a loved one. Share it with someone that you trust. Share it with a pastor, with me or with Bill, with an elder. Share it with someone so that you're not carrying this burden alone. God has never wants you to face life's challenges alone. He wants to give you grace. He wants to give you help. So no matter what you're facing, know that the truth is that God is on your side. As you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, know that God is on your side. And, and to finish up, I want to finish this with some verses to, to demonstrate that in terms of how Jesus is on our side from Romans chapter 8, the great, the great book of Romans. Starting in verse 35, these great words from the Apostle Paul. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now look at these words that I'm about to read. Think about them in light of the valley of the shadow of death. Think about these words in light of the good shepherd. Jesus himself, right? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long and we are considered sheep to be slaughtered. And then verse 37, no, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him, through him who loved us. For I am convinced Right? I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You could say it through your mask. Amen. Amen. Or say it at home. Amen. Talk to the mirror. Whatever it is, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And so whatever you're facing today, whatever valley that's in front of you, whether it's relational, financial, physical, or some other form, turn to Jesus. Call upon his name. Trust as you commit to walk forward with him that he is not going to leave you on your own. He's going to walk with you. Not only light the way, but guard the way 
protect the way, and lead you through it to the other side. You may not be able to see it now, but God sees it. He knows what you're facing. He wants to walk with you. Let's finish uh, with a word of prayer. And as we've been doing it to conclude these sermons is to to pray Psalm 23 together, uh, to read it out loud, and to really name this reality. We're going to read the whole psalm as we've been working through it. And and, uh, I invite you to make this your prayer. Will you pray this with me? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. As we continue in worship, as we come to a time of communion now. uh, For those who are gathered here in person as we share in communion, I invite you to pull out your communion kit. For those of you who are joining us online, I invite you to use this time as a time of prayer and a time of reflection. And for those who are unable to join us here in person, I invite you to, that, that invite you to consider having us bring communion to you. And so to do that, Bill or I will come to you with communion and to pray with you, uh, to share communion with you, and to have that moment as well. And so you can, to do that, I invite you to reach out to your congregational care person. If you don't know who that is, you can write to info at restorationrva.org and uh, we'll set up an appointment to come share communion with you uh, outdoors. Um, and as we continue in this time of communion here, I invite us to consider Jesus' words in John 15 when he says this, there's no greater love than this. That a person would lay down his or her life for their friends. No greater love. Jesus said those words before he went to the cross. And those words weren't just words. Jesus went and then he lived them out and he laid down his life for you and for me. And so we come now to celebrate communion and to to, to remember what Christ has done. To confess our sins. To thank him for that forgiveness and new life. And to celebrate Not only what we can celebrate now, but it's a foretaste of celebrating what we will experience in full together in his presence forever. Um, And so as we do, we're going to have a time of prayer in a a moment. Um, And in that time of prayer, I'm going to ask us to take a moment to silently consider what is God showing us right now? What is he showing you right now? And specifically showing you in a way that uh, something that you need to confess to him. Something in your life that maybe you're holding on to. Something in your life that you're pursuing that that you know deep inside isn't what God wants you to pursue. That he has something better for you. Um, And he's offering himself to you. And the beauty of this time of Lord's Supper and Communion is we can receive him afresh tonight. Um, And so before we pray, as a reminder, when Jesus gathered his disciples He took bread during the meal and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. He said, take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. Later on in the meal, he took the cup. And then he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. He said, take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. We're taught by the Apostle Paul in one of the letters to the Corinthians that for as long as we eat of this bread, for as long as we drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes again. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, We look to you afresh today. 
Lord, you know our struggles. You know the ways, God, that we have not honored you with our thoughts or attitudes and actions. Lord, we come to you now in a, in a posture of humility, seeking your grace, recognizing, God, that you are the, good, you are the giver of good gifts. But in many ways, Lord, we reject your good gifts and we go look to other places or other things or other people for what you alone can provide, which is true life. So God, we take a moment now and it's a moment of silence to, to reflect on, Lord, what is it, Lord, that we need to confess to you? Some form of sin, Lord, where we have based on what we've either done or what we've failed to do in light of your word, your commands, and your laws. So Lord, hear our prayers as we take this time of silence to confess to you. Holy Spirit, you are the one who is the great comforter. You're also the one who convicts, and both of those go together. Ultimately, your conviction leads to the ultimate comfort, which comes from coming back to the good shepherd. And so, Lord, we confess these sins to you. We thank you, Lord, that your promise that if, that if we confess our sins, God, that you are faithful and just, and you promise to cleanse us from all of our sin. to lead us in the way everlasting. So receive our prayers, receive our confessions. And now, Lord, we ask, I ask that you would move in and through this time of communion. Through these, through these elements, through this time, Holy Spirit, lift up our eyes to Jesus again. We pray this in his name. Amen. And so we'll receive uh, the elements together. And so I invite you to take, open the top, the top piece to get to the wafer. And this is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. And this is the blood of Christ. Shed for your forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. Let's pray one more time. Lord, you are good and what you do is good. Thank you for moments like this that we can taste and see that you are good. Again, draw us back to you, Lord. In the places that we have walked away from you, bring us back to you so we can honor you with our lives. Love you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love our neighbor as ourself. And love one another like you have loved us. May we continue to learn to love. And may we learn to look, love, and live like Jesus as his disciples. We give this all to you in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Let's worship together. If you feel inclined, you're welcome to stand and sing with us. It's a familiar song, and it's really great to be able to be together and worship, even if you're with us virtually. I love that God is with us wherever we go, and that's what this song is about. So worship with us. of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is 
is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange. As we finish a couple announcements as we, before we head out, Christmas Eve, we are scheduled to gather here 
at 8 p.m. Boy, Mechanicsville Christian Center, their generosity continues. And boy, it was great to get a text message from their pastor, Matt, Hull, Matt Hool, earlier this morning. Matt was writing me saying, give them the Holy Spirit, right? So that was, uh, I mean, we, this is so much good stuff that God is doing between our two churches. And for them to offer, for us to meet here on Christmas Eve is a fantastic gift. So we are gathering here, 8 o'clock. Um, the registration will go online in the, in the coming weeks, and we need you to register so we can plan accordingly, uh, so we can gather faithfully and safely here for Christmas Eve. Uh, the next announcement is we're, we are uh, continuing to support the branch with their work with Angel Tree. And so uh, the deadline is tomorrow. You could go to our website. You could see there's a sign-up genius for opportunities to partner with them in terms of providing gifts as we serve families in Ashland. Uh, please take a look at that as you consider ways to love and serve in this Christmas season. Um, as we finish, I invite you as we're going to, I'll give a final benediction and blessing. We ask that as you leave, that you leave out through the back, uh, from the back rows first towards the front. And uh, we know we'd love to be able to gather and connect, but um, in light of safety, we ask that you head actually out into the parking lot if you want to connect with people. It's not as cold as other days. I invite you to connect with people outside, but not in the foyer. And uh, you could drop your trash bags in the trash cans on the way out as well. Um, so with that said, hear these words of benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all until we gather again. And all God's people said, amen.